So in this lecture, we are going to summarize the laboratory variation of the hemostasis. When do we need to evaluate the hemostasis? When do we have to measure the hemostatic parameters? There are two major categories, when the patient does have some symptoms or some other patient that they do not have any kind of symptoms. Let's see those when we do have some symptoms, such as, for example, the patient has some kind of bleeding tendency, or a family member of the patient had any problem with the bleeding tendency, or an explained diffuse bleeding during surgery or following trauma. The asymptomatic cases when the coagulation alteration uncovered with a routine test or the coagulation alteration uncovered when testing prior to the operation. The classification of the hemostatic disorders, there are two major categories. One, when we do have the hypofunction of the hemostatic processes that usually manifested as a bleeding tendency. The bleeding tendency can be superficial or deep bleeding. This is what is called the hemorrhagic diathesis. Or when we do have the hyperfunctioning of the hemostatic processes, that is called thrombophilia or hypercoagulability stages. In both cases, major cases, we can have the vascular or platelet disorders and, of course, can be inherited or acquired one, and there are some coagulation abnormalities that also can be inherited or acquired one. Very similarly, in the hyperfunction, that can be caused due to the vascular or platelet disorders or some kind of coagulation disorders, and again, we do have some inherited and acquired symptoms. What kind of test we can use for the evaluation of the bleeding? First of all, we do have some screening test when we can test first the patient whether they do have a problem or not, or when we do have some specific abnormalities, we can use some specific test. The screening test, the most common and relatively the easiest one to perform is called the bleeding time. This bleeding time evaluates the platelet function and number and the blood vessel function. Usually the bleeding time is not influenced in any kind of coagulation disorders. Prothrombin time, this is measuring the coagulation and the extrinsic pathways. The activated partial thromboplastin time, or this abbreviation is APTT, they measures the intrinsic pathways and, of course, the common pathways as well. Why thrombin time is used to measure both pathways because this is a the common one. The fibrinogen fibrin conversion is measured by this time. The specific test includes the factor measurements or measuring the degradation product of the fibrin degradation product, such as this called as FDP, or the D-timer assay. This is measuring the stable clot formation, the presence of the stable clot formation, and they are measuring the fibrolytic processes. The platelet function studies, such as measuring the adhesion capability, the aggregation abnormality, or release and the prostaglandin pathways is tested right here. Or in some case, we can use the bone marrow biopsy and the smear. Let's first look at the laboratory assessment of the vasculature and the platelet-related bleeding that usually cause a superficial bleeding tendency. The bleeding time that estimates the vessel function and the platelet number and its function. The bleeding time is proportionally changing with the number of the platelet. However, it will be abnormal when the platelet decreases below 100 giga per liter. The normal bleeding time is usually between 3 and 8 minutes. The spontaneous bleeding or petechias occurs when the platelet number decreases below 
50 giga per liter or further down 30 or 20 giga per liters. The first bleeding tendency or petechias occurs in lower extremities when the hydrostatic pressure is the highest one. Increased bleeding time in the presence of a normal or higher platelet count indicates the impaired platelet function. Now, to measure the bleeding time, there are two methods in use. That's a Duke method. You can find the link to the YouTube videos. Or the IVs method, that is the most commonly uh, can be seen in Hungary, for example, and the link pointed toward that one. The gradually becomes, however, outdated these two methods because it's not so controlled and they can have a very big variable between who is performing the test. This is why now they started to use and now this in compressed is the PFA or platelet function analysis 100. This is taking over this bleeding time measurement. The capillary fragility test. This is called the Rumpel lead capillary fragility test or Turnic test. It assesses the fragility of the capillary wall and is used to identify thrombocytopenia as well. The test may not have with high specificity. It can interfere with some factors, such as, for example, a woman in a premenstrual cycle or in postmenopausal one uh, and not taking any hormones or those with sun-damaged skin, since all will have increased capillary fragility. How do we perform this Rumpel-Lee test? First of all, we measure the blood pressure of the patient and inflate the cuff uh, to a point midway between the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic pressure and maintain there for five minutes. After deflating the cuff, we are waiting for two minutes and we will count the number of the petechias below the subcubital fossa. Now, the positive test is 10 or more petechias per square inch. That means about 6 per square centimeters. The laboratory evaluation of the platelet-related bleeding. First of all, we can measure the, bleed, uh, the platelet count or the bleeding time and Next one is a platelet aggregation test. These patient aggregate and tests can be measured with using a LUMI aggregometer, and we can use some substances such as ADP, thrombin, collagen, epinephrine, isocetin, reptilase, and steak venom. They will activate the platelet in different systems, and for this we have to collect the platelet and rich plasma, and after we use this lumin aggregator. Or we can measure this platelet function analyzer using the PFA, as I mentioned earlier, and again, we can use some different discs, such as the epinephrine or ADP containing discs. Let's look at first the lumin aggregometer. First of all, we will collect blood into the citrate containing tube. This is, if you go to the lab, you will see this a blue cup. After, with a slow speed centrifugation, we are making the platelet enriched plasma and we perform the aggregating test using different uh, agonists that stimulate the platelets in different uh, systems. You can find this uh, YouTube link below and if you uh, click on it, you will see the different areas. Let's see what will happen when we use this lumino aggregator. We put the platelet enriched plasma into the tube, and after we add different agents, different agonists, such as, for example, ADP that is going to activate the platelet to the fibrinogen receptors, or ristocetin that's going to activate the platelet to the surface activating receptors, or the collagen that activates the platelet to the uh, fibrinogen receptor as well, or arachidonic acid, that's again, that is important in the arachidonic acid pathway and the thromboxane pathways. And, and epinephrine sometimes we use as well. Let's look at, for example, what will happen when we apply this ADP aggregation. First of all, as you do see here, we apply the controls 
and after we use the test. As you see here, there is nothing happening with the ADP, so the Fibrinogy receptor doesn't work. However, when we apply the Ristocetin, the Ristocetin, that's a surface activating pathways, that relatively a little bit is going to activate uh, the platelet aggregation, but not as much as a normal should be. And another thing, for example, the collagen, the collagen activation, again, in this position, as you see here, that is abnormal. And arachidonic acid is abnormal as well. So what we found out, the marked reduction of the platelet aggregation to the ADP, collagen, arachidonic acid, and epinephrine, with might decrease in the ristocetin, these all suggesting that this patient has a Glanzmann thrombasthenia. In the next patient, when, as you see here, the ADP aggregation is normal, the collagen aggregation is normal, and the epinephrine aggregation is normal. However, we do have a problem with the ristocetin aggregation in this patient. So, what is the summary? This uh, ADP collagen, arachidonic acid, and epinephrine is okay. Uh, however, we do have a decrease of the ristocetin that didn't get corrected by the mixing with the normal plasma. Uh, we are going to usually mix with the plasma to avoid the antibodies that again can bind and can eliminate this uh, aggregation. So that could be this called the bernard sullier disease or bernard sullier syndrome. In this next examples, we do have a marked reduction of the platelet aggregation induced by ADP, epinephrine. However, we do have a normal collagen, and we do have relatively a normal ristocetin aggregation. This is all suggesting that this patient could have a problem with the platelet is a storage pool disorder. Another one that is most used today is that's a platelet function analyzer with its abbreviation is PFA100. This is a global test for the measuring the platelet adhesion and aggregation. Relatively, this is a non-invasive technique and relatively we can use for the whole blood to measure it. It's very easy to perform and very, very sensitive to detecting any kind of platelet defect, especially with associated with the form V. Lebron disease, and sensitive to diagnose an acquired platelet defect as well. Now, this is used, and especially very nicely can be used, monitoring of the procoagulant treatment as well, such as, for example, when we use the desmopressin or aspirin or other. How do we perform? First of all, we're collecting the whole blood, and after the blood is pipetted into the little chamber, and this blood is sucking through the capillaries, and we do have a little diskette. Now, this is when it's sucking through this diskette. This diskette is impregnated with different uh, substances, such as, for example, collagen, epinephrine, ADP, and when the platelet adhere or adhesion increases, this platelet plug is going to close this little hole, and this instrument is measuring, it's called the closing time or closure time. And using different agonists, we can assume that when, what kind of problem the patient could have. Relatively, this kind of measurement is mimicking the high shear that usually mimics the arterial circulation. Now, let's give what can happen. If we do have a prolonged uh, closure time when we use this epinephrine diskette, but we do have a normal ADP uh, closing time for this ADP diskette, that is an aspirin or NSAID this applied. However, when we do have a prolonged epinephrine at ADP closure time, that could be due to the Glanzmann thrombasthenia or the bernard sullier syndrome or is a severe von Willebrand. This is the type 2 and type 3.
The low sensitivity for mild bleeding disorder, storage pool diseases, and secretion deficiency, or mild von Leibniz disease. So that is a disadvantage of this analyzing technique, but relatively it's very easy to perform and it's a non-invasive one. Now let's look at the next one, the coagulation. How do we assess the coagulation? And usually clinically is manifested with a deep bleeding tendency. Now, if you summarize or if you recall the coagulation cascade, what we learn in physiology, you know that there are three major parts of these coagulation pathways in laboratory coagulation. However, in the physiologically, there cannot be distinguished this kind of pathways. Now, let's look at first of all. The intrinsic pathways that we do measure as an APTT or APT time or activated partial thromboplastin time, they're measuring the surface activation and how this factor 12, 11, 9 in activates the 10. And after we do have a complex that is a trom uh, thrombinase complex or that is going to convert the prothrombin thrombin conversion, and we are getting into the fibrogen fibrin conversion. Another one is an extrinsic pathways that is measured, that usually the tissue damage activate the tissue factors, and together with the HATE uh, 7A, that will activate again, it's making the thrombinase complex, and we do have the same kind of fibrogen fibrin conversion, and we do have the common pathways that including the thrombinase activity and the fibrinogen fibrin conversion and the stable fibrin clot formation with the factor 13 uh, activation. Now, let's look at first the prothrombin tie that measures the extrinsic pathways. This evil is the production of the thrombin and the fibrin by the extrinsic and the common pathways. How do we initiate? Usually we are using the tissue thromboplastin that made from a brain extract, the slattery, usually they're getting the slattery and isolating, or some synthetic factors plus lipids is added. Usually we are using a natural lipids and calcium is added to the citrate plasma. What we do, we measure the clotting time, how much it takes. It can be measured by some kind of mechanical or optical uh, coagulometers. What we do if we have a prolonged uh, P time, prothrombin time, that could be connected with the following factor deficiency, such as factor 1, factor 2, factor 5, factor 7, or factor 10. Now, uh, or if somebody is taking the anti-coagulant, uh, such as the warfarin, the vitamin K antagonist, this is how they are testing the amount of warfarin treatment or vitamin K antagonist. This is, this is how they are using the prothrombin time. The number one is 10 to 14 seconds, however, is mostly expressed as the INR or international ratio that the value is between 0.9 and 1.3. It doesn't have any kind of time. What is the INR? This is what is called the international normalized ratio, is a way of expressing prothrombin time. And because this is a standardized manner, a lot of people is taking, for example, warfarin, and when we are traveling within and between countries, there is no difference in INR values. This is why if you travel to the US or travel to Germany or any place, if they say that your INR value in a therapeutic range, your warfarin treatment or vitamin antagonist treatment is properly adjusted. And if it's a different one, you have to adjust your warfarin treatment so you won't have any problem you don't have you won't have any kind of bleeding disorders or any kind of thrombophilias now as you see here in the INR we do have the patient prothrombin time is measured in seconds and is divided by the control prothrombin time and this is a power of the IS, uh, ISI this is called the international sensitivity index that usually is a typical for that uh, thromboplastin that they are using because when they are collecting uh, 
from different sources thromboplastin that can be a little bit altered different different of course the uh, companies is going to dilute it going to adjust it but it can be a little bit uh, variety between the uh, stock values and this is why they want to change it let's look at the next text that this is the measuring the intrinsic pathways and this is the activated partial thromboplastin time or its abbreviation is aptt this is what is measuring the required to generate the thrombin and the fibrin polymers by the intrinsic and the common pathways. How do we initiate? Again, we are collecting the citrate plasma and after we add phospholipid and a surface such as a kaolin and calcium. So the measurement usually very similar to the PT or we are using the mechanical or optical coagulometer. And what do we measure? As you recall, the intrinsic pathway that includes the factor 12, how they convert it to the active 12 or Hageman factor, precalicrine to calicrine, and 11 to 11A to produce the fibrin. Now, as say for a precalicrine or a heavy molecular weight kininogen or 12, 11, 8, 10, 5, 2 and 1 factors, usually this is what is going to be involved in this whole process. Now what do we have if you do have a prolonged APTT? Of course this mentioned factor levels are decreased or another possibility we do have some kind of circulating antibody what is called the anticoagulant such as happening for example the SLE this is called the lupus anticoagulant. The normal value is 30 to 40 seconds, and uh, this is expressed in seconds. They used to use this APTT to measure the heparin dose. However, today we're using this uh, low molecular weight heparin or fractionalized heparin. It's not needed any kind of test to measure. Now, as we mentioned, this is the anti uh, coagulant or such as the lupus anticoagulant but there can be some other autoimmune uh, autobodies that again is developed against the factor 8, factor 9 or factor 7 as you see here. That meaning that the level of the factor 9 for example or factor 8 can be lower and this is why for example a factor 8 deficiency can develop in women not only in men. So we have to exclude this kind of anticoagulants or inhibitors of the coagulation pathways. Now, how do we detect these inhibitors? Relatively, the easiest one to use, for example, a dilution. We are going to dilute the patient plasma with a normal plasma. What will happen? Because the test, such as a PT or APT test, is developed that if you do have a decrease of the factor below 20 percentage, if the patient has a factor deficiency, and if you dilute the samples with a one-to-one -one dilution with a normal plasma, if the patient does not have any kind of factor, this addition will bring up the factor level to 50%. So that's going to normalize, let's see, the uh, coagulation. That that's meaning that the patient possibly has a factor deficiency. However, if this mixing is not going to correct the time, the coagulation time, that we are assuming that this patient possibly has an inhibitors. All right. So another thing, if the prothrombin time and APTT are prolonged, we possibly we have an inhibitor of the common pathways or a strong lupus inhibitor. If only the prothrombin time is prolonged, we do have an inhibitor that usually involves the extrinsic pathways. This situation is very rare. However, if we do have only the APTT is prolonged, we do have the inhibitors of the intrinsic pathways or we do have a lupus inhibitors or anticoagulant. So this is how can we figure out some kind of the presence of these autoimmune mediated inhibitors.
Now, how do we rule out the lupus anticoagulant? What are these lupus anticoagulants? Usually, this is anticoagulants that is directed against the membrane. Usually, the phospholipid or the protein is located in the phospholipid membrane. So, what will happen? If we apply only this membrane, only this phospholipid in the catalytic units, this antibody is completely covering, let's see, the surface. So there's no chance that thrombinase complex can develop in this platelet surface or the phospholipid surface. So what will happen? We are measuring, let's see, an increased APT time. Now, what do we do? As I mentioned, we are checking with the dilution, but we do have a problem with the dilution. Of course, what we can do? We can use, for example, an artificial phospholipid. We can use a test that is less sensitive to this antibody because we are using a hexagonal phase phospholipid. And of course, that is going to normalize the APT time. If we are for example, if the patient has this problem, again, we do have this the presence of this anticoagulant, lupus anticoagulant. After we can, we can confer using the uh, ELISA or ELIS measurement for the phospholipid antibodies. And after we can detect this patient has this lupus anticoagulant. The next test that I mentioned, this is the thrombin time. The thrombin time determines the rate of the thrombin-induced cleavage uh, to the fibrinogen to fibrin monomer to form a fibrin clot. What's going to initiate? Basically, we are using the diluted bovine thrombin is added to the citrated plasma together with the calcium, and we're measuring the clotting time or the fibrin polymer formation using a mechanical or optical coagulometer. Now, what will happen when it's prolonged? Usually, this is associated with a decreased fibrinogen concentration that can be measured after that the amount of the fibrinogen. Or we do have an abnormality of the fibrinogen. This is called the dysfibrinogenia. Or the presence of the thrombin inhibitor in the circulation. This all can influence the thrombin time. The values, usually the thrombin time, is less than 20 seconds. We do have another possibility to test the coagulation, and that's a point of care technique. This is called the activated clotting time measurement. This gives you an immediately turnaround result, and this is why they are using in a surgical ward, such as, for example, when they do perform a cardiac surgery or PCI or any other surgical invention, and to see how the patient coagulation system is working. But it can be used, uh, for example, to adjust the anticoagulant doses if it's needed. For example, if the heparin is needed, for example, or thrombin inhibitor therapy is needed. And by using this technique, it can be used right away. Now, how do they work? First of all, we add blood to the cartridge, press start very easily. So what we do have in this cartridge, we do have a choline or some kind of diatomaceous uh, earth. And when we inserted the cartridge into the instrument, this is automatically mixing. And how did they detect the clot formation? They are using a synthetic thrombin substrate and using a technique, this electroactive compound form, and detected by the amperometrically. So the, uh, the potential is measured and the clotting time is reported. So relatively is a very fast and very good measurement to assess the patient uh, coagulation status, for example, in an acute situation. Another thing, when we assuming that the fibrinogen level could be decreased, we can detect it. And that is important, for example, when we do have a deficiencies, for example, or the fibrin formation, that can be, for example, liver diseases, or in DIC, when we do have a consumption uh, coagulopathy, when we are, the body is using up the fibrinogen. The normal value is between 2 and 9 gram per liter. Now, the specific uh, assay of the coagulation factors. Let's see, the APTT or the PT-based uh, assays, usually the uh, 
can apply and can use for the dilution with a single factor deficiency plasma for patient or manufactured. This is goes basically directly to assess which factor is missing from the patient. Because that plasma that is deficient for the factor, it won't normalize the APTT or PT uh, assay of the patient assay. So it's, uh, that's corrective effect of the measurement plasma is determining the basis of a glossly elongated clotting time. Another thing, the alternative chemical or chromogenic substrate and immunologic based techniques can be used to assess which factors is missing. And usually we do have a percentage highs ex expressed, but be careful, this percentage should be below 50% when you're assuming that that's the cause of the elongation of the uh, coagulation time. Now, uh, Quantitation of the factor 8 inhibitors. This is what is called the Bethesda method. This is used. Usually, we are making the multiple dilution of the patient samples and we are mixing the samples with the normal uh, pooled plasma. And as a normal pooled plasma, we mix with one to one with this uh, buffer standard curve and the incubation for at least two hours and measure the residual factor eight and usually what we expressing as a dilution that gives you about 50 percent residues and that is called the Bethesda unit so if you do have a very a potent anticoagulant, relatively you have to dilute more 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 times and when you for example, you are getting a one to 600 times dilution when relatively this inhibition disappears. That could be the Bethesda unit. Now, fibrinolysis assessment, that's a slow process if the clot dissolves and usually is associated with the tissue plasminogen activated release from the endothelial cells. And what will happen, that is going to convert the plasminogen to plasmin to degradate the fibrin and the fibrin into the fibrinogen degradation product. This is what is called the fib FDP. Now, among these FDP products that can be as a longitudinal cutting of the fibrinogen or the cross link between the fibrinogens. We do have this is called the D dimers. The D dimers relatively this cross link proteins and that indicate a stable clot formation. It's meaning that the factor 13 made a stable clot formation. So this is why the D dimer is more specific one. What the D-dimer is used for, for example, when we do have venosus thromboembolism or DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, but it's really increased in infection or cancer or during pregnancy as well. So this is why the D-dimer is not so specific to assess the clot formation. Now, testing for fibrinolytic activities. This instrument is not generally used, but in some lab it's still uh, applied, and that's called the thromboelastography or TEG, or in some cases the thromboelastometry or ROTEM. This is globally assessed the hemostatic function, evaluate the reaction of the platelet with the protein coagulation cascade observed plus the fibrinolytic processes measure. So, First of all, the initial platelet fibrin interaction, the platelet aggregation, the clot strengthening and fibrin crosslink formation, and eventually is measure the clot lysis as well. You can find some link here. If you want to see how does it work or how does it function, you can click on it and you can watch it. Basically what it has, it has a little, let's see, spoon, and that spoon is going to rotate in a little chamber when you put a little blood and this little blood it starts to form some clot. What will happen? They are measuring the force that is needed to steer this little spoon and they are going to draw the line. Of course, when we do have a more viscosity develops due to the fibrin formation or 
that is going to force this increase, this increases. However, when we do have the fibrinolysis, and that force is be less and less and less. So the first part of this test measuring the coagulation, and from different part of the curve can you evaluate the platelet function or the act or the fibrin formation, and later on the degradation can be assessed using this. Uh, thromboelastographic method. Now, this is how, for example, I summarize for you the different portion. For example, the first one, that's how the fibrin formation is occurs. This is the alpha angle. This is why the speed of the solid clot formation occurs. After we do have the A, 60 that measures the clot lysis or retraction at 60 seconds. The key, this is the clot formation time, and MA, that's the absolute strength of the fibrin. This is making the very viscosic uh, milieu, and R, the rate of the initial fibrin formation, so how does it start to work, and that's going to depend on the platelet function mainly. So, as you see here, the shape of this uh, uh, thromboelastogram, that's a normal one. If we do have an increased fibrolysis, as you see that the tail, the last part is going to be decreased, or we do have a hypercoagulability, of course, the strength is be very wide one. In hemophilia, the clot formation is delayed, or uh, thrombocytopenia, uh, thrombocytopenia, when we do have relatively, it is, everything is so small, it's not enough, uh, fibrin is made. Now, let's look at first the next big group when we do have an excess clot formation, and this is what is called thrombophilia. Now, uh, what's going to limit the thrombus formation in our body? Basically, the blood flow because the blood flow is going to dilute out the coagulation factors and removing from the area when it's formed, so that is clearly measured. The endothelium that's making a surface when the platelet cannot assert, or making some, it's called a thrombomodulin, that is altering the coagulation pathways, and this is a place when we do have the plasminogen activator. The plasminogen plasmin formation, that usually that's an other important one, that the plasmin that is going to dissolve the fibrin or the different factors is inhibited. Or we do have some other inhibitors of activated factors, such as the antithrombin 3, heparin, alpha 2, antiplasmin, or protein C that uh, connected to the active factor 8 or factor 5 and the fibrinolysis. And we do have the fibrin degradation product that we do have a fibrin formation when it's a fibrinolysis is uh, cleaving it, and that will inhibit the further fibrin formation. Now, what kind of inherited risk factor we do have for thrombophilias? First of all, the very common one is called the factor 5, or it's called Leiden mutation. When we do have a mutation, and the position of the factor 5 is the 506 position, the arginine is a glutaminic acid uh, changes. Or antithrombin 3 deficiency, protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, or very rare when we do have a prothrombin gene variant, when at the uh, glutaminic acid and alanine transition at the position of uh, 20,210, and that can be causing an other thrombophilias, or when we do have this uh, fibrinogenemias that again can uh, cause uh, thrombophilias. Now, there are, however, some acquired risk factors of thrombophilias, such as, for example, aging. When you are getting older, you have a higher chance to develop thrombus formation. Or if somebody had a prior thrombosis or immobilization, for example, a prolonged air travel or any kind of traveling, or you are laying on the bed because you are sick or after surgical invention. But surgical invention, not only the immobilization, but the tissue factor liberation is causing a problem. This is why they apply heparin after surgical invention. Malignancy, 
uh, again another risk factor for thrombophilias or estrogen treatment and that's for example estrogen treatment or hormone replacement therapy especially in those who has uh, light mutation increases the chance to develop uh, thrombus formations more than 100 times or antiphospholipid syndrome when we do have this antibody because in the in vivo what will happen we do have the antibodies that directed against the phospholipid and that's going to activate the platelet and inhibit the endothelial function this is why the patient usually has a thrombus formation however when we measure the aptt time that's be elongated due to the antibody against the phospholipid that usually it's covering the phospholipid layer so it's no chance to develop the thrombinase complex. So this is, looks like the patient had thrombophilias in vivo. However, in vitro test, we do have hemophilias. So how can it be? Because we do have these antiphospholipids. Or any other myeloproliferative diseases, for example, or heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, and that again can cause thrombophilias because this antibody that against this heparin, that can uh, activate the platelets and causes coagulation and causes a thrombus formation. However, meanwhile, the number of the platelet is going to decrease. There are some unknown or mixed risk factor for thrombophilias, such as, for example, when the patient has hyperhomocysteinemias, when we do have a methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase deficiency or some genetic alteration of this one, or we can have elevated levels of factor eight, or the patient can have an acquired protein C resistance in the absence of uh, factor five, the Leiden mutation, and elevated levels of such factors such as a nine or 11. Now, which test should be performed uh, for example, the factor 5 delayed the mutation, per activated protein C resistance and or genetic analysis could be measured, or the prothrombin 2210, uh, some kind of genetic alteration or genome analysis, the GA uh, exchange, or antithrombin 3, we can measure some functional assay to follow it, or protein C, for example, again, the functional assay could be used, or protein C, functional assay with antigenic assays, if it's indicated, and antiphospholipid and antibody testing, or homocysteine level, or factor 8 level, or factor 9, or factor 11 level, which factor could be elevated. Now we have to talk about a little bit about the disseminated intravascular coagulation or coagulopathy because that's a leading problem, especially in shock or and the patient could develop first trom uh, thrombophilias and later on it can have a coagulopathy developed. And this is what is called a consumptive coagulopathy or defibrination syndrome. And uh, results of another complication or diseases due to uh, various traumas or diseases that leads to widespread tissue thromboplastin formation, exposure, and tribrin formation. Now, what will happen when this disease start to develop? First of all, we do have a decreased platelet number, so it's meaning the platelet aggregation is turned on and the clot formation is started. So the platelet and the coagulation factors consumed and later on the thrombin clase fibrogen, fibrin deposition, and that's activated by the fibrinolytic processes and inhibits the further platelet and fibrin polymerization and it's ended up with the bleeding disorders. So we do have a decrease in the inhibition levels as well. Now, the thrombin formation is a central mechanism of the conceptive coagulopathy, and it's very important to recognize as early as we can. How can we test for DIC? First of all, we can measure the sequence measurement of the platelet count. This is how it's changing in time, or the fibrinogen level that could be low or we can measure the thrombin time, the APTT time, and relatively we do have an elongation of the both time. Or another thing, we can measure the fibrin degradation product, the presence, or the D-dimer in the serum, and such as in the urine as well.
In the next table, I summarize those conditions that could be differentiated using the platelet count, prothrombin time, APTT, or thrombin time. Let's start first with the DIC. In DIC, what we do have decreased platelet count, elongated of the prothrombin time and APTT, and we do have an elongation of the thrombin time as well. What will happen when we do have a liver failure? Liver failure, of course, we can have a decreased platelet count. This can be due to the increased portal hypertension and splenomegaly, or it's, we do have a problem with the coagulation factor synthesis. This is why the PT and APTT is elongated and the thrombin time is elongated as well because the decreased fibrinogen level. In massive uh, transfusion, again, that's an immune-mediated process, we can have both the pro uh, platelet count decreases, we do have an elongation of the prothrombin time and APTT, why usually we do have a normal thrombin time. When the patient uh, has some kind of vitamin K antagonist therapy, or maybe it's overdosed, we do have a normal, proton, a normal platelet count, but we do have a very highly incre uh, increased prothrombin time. And APTT is elongated as well, but not as much as the uh, PT time, and the thrombin time is normal. Heparin, when we use the heparin, very much is the similar, except the APTT is elongated more than a prothrombin time. And if you do have a circulating anticoagulant, that's depending on which uh, anticoagulant we do have, or the prothrombin time or APTT, or any of them is elongated more or less. And other differentiation or differential diagnosis should be made between the liver failure versus DIC. Now, if you're looking at the D-dimer, usually the D-dimer is elevated very much in the DIC, where relatively in liver failure is normal or slightly elevated only. The factor VIII is not synthesized by the hepatocytes only. The factor VIII levels are usually normal or increased in liver diseases. However, if you look at factor V, in both cases will decrease because factor V is synthesized by the liver. And in case of liver failure and DIC, in both cases, factor V level is decreased, by factor VIII level is not influenced.